Kia ora. I want to begin by acknowledging the ancestors of this land on whose expulsion and colonization we sit. And that constitutes the fundamental infrastructure on which I'm speaking today. I want to take this moment also to thank my ancestors who have taught me the importance of uh, social justice as the anchor to the generation of knowledge. I want to thank uh, those union organizers, activists, left party organizers, anti-colonial protesters that form the basis of the conversation that I'm going to join into today. I also finally want to thank Lee for organizing this uh, special panel that uh, brings together some of my uh, favorite scholars to think about and discuss what open science looks like and what the conversation on open science ought to be looking at um, as we um, consider the horizon. I'm going to frame my talk in terms of the question of epistemicide, the uh, usage of colonial tools to fundamentally erase sites of knowledge production in the global south, and discuss the ways in which we can resist epistemicide through the active work of building knowledge infrastructure. The way this talk will be presented then is that I will begin by discussing the question of epistemicide as the setting for framing the culture-centered approach, uh, which is the approach that I've been working on over the last two decades, with the question of what does it mean to listen to voices at the subaltern margins that have historically and systematically been erased from discursive spaces. I will then discuss the question of subaltern science and indigenous knowledge production, uh, the ways in which indigenous knowledge um, intervenes into hegemonic uh, structures of knowledge production, and how then does that offer an imaginary for indigenous futures. What I have for you here as a way to frame this conversation is an image of a woman, uh, mostly Dalit or untouchable women, organized within the context of India's agrarian margins, India's rural margins, in the backdrop of the large scale epidemic of um, farmer suicides in India. And they're organizing to put forth and to circulate an indigenous form of agriculture that is embedded in indigenous science and indigenous practice, but also is deeply committed to interrupting and disrupting the neo-colonial, neoliberal project. So this work of the women uh, takes the form of the millet network, uh, which is anchored in uh, the production of and the circulation of um, millets as climate resistant crop that are embedded in indigenous livelihoods and indigenous struggles. So the concept of epistemicide is rooted in the acknowledgement that the production of knowledge and more specifically the production of scientific knowledge is a colonial capitalist project. Uh, knowledge itself as an instrument uh, works to perpetuate capital, to create new markets for capital, while at the same time colonizing new spaces, bringing these spaces under the control of capital. In fact, the frontiers of contemporary neoliberalism constitute new forms of colonialism that uh, venture into indigenous lands, indigenous livelihoods, in order to uh, expel indigenous people from their spaces of living, and B, to co-opt uh, indigenous forms of knowledge in order to um, uh, circulate capital and create new extractive zones of profiteering. So the project of science, in this sense, is embedded 
in the logics of whiteness, the norms of whiteness, the principles of whiteness that use science and deploy science in particular ways in order to exclude sciences from the margins. Here, the key point to note is that uh, the margins then are actively created through works of erasure. Uh, the processes of communicative erasure, the processes of delegitimization, the processes of um, stigmatization, uh, the processes of stealing off the agency of subaltern peoples works precisely to prop up a form of science that perpetuates the colonial exercise. And within this colonial exercise then is the concept of colonial theft. We of course witness that in the form of biopiracy, the stealing of um, indigenous um, germplasm, um, indigenous life, indigenous biologies in order to create and networks of profiteering. Uh, but we also see it in terms of uh, the stealing of indigenous spaces, uh, indigenous um, land, in indigenous sites of inhabiting, uh, water, mountains, uh, those spaces that are considered sacred, often under the rhetoric of science and through the deployment of technologies of science. So although the argument, of course, often goes that, oh, you have to separate science from the specific techniques and technologies, uh, from an indigenous standpoint, science itself is an instrument of whiteness that holds up and reproduces these uh, technologies. So the kind of techno-deterministic solutions that are put forth to address uh, global crises then work to perpetuate these new forms of uh, colonization. A great example of this, for instance, is if you look at the sustainable futures and the um, uh, framework of sustainable science that is put forth, it is often again embedded within the hegemonic structures of colonization while simultaneously erasing the subaltern communities from the margins. So colonial destruction in that sense is inherent in the production of transnational markets. Indigenous livelihoods, forms of living must be destroyed so that markets can be created, markets can be upheld, and markets can be circulated across spaces. So this work of epistemicide, the erasure of um, indigenous ways of uh, knowledge generation of indigenous knowledge claims is both material and symbolic. At the symbolic level, it works through the deployment of colonial communication infrastructures that are consistently at work to delegitimize indigenous knowledge, to stigmatize indigenous knowledge in order to create uh, the market mechanisms for hegemonic white science. At the same time, the violence is material because in order to carry out these expulsions and extract extractions, um, indigenous peoples uh, must be uh, removed from their spaces of livelihood, often through the use of force, uh, through the deployment of the police and the military. So you see this in the frontiers of neoliberal capital that um, the ongoing attacks of capital are deployed through the arms of the state, uh, through the deployment of uh, the military, paramilitary and um, the police in order to murder, in order to incarcerate, and then fundamentally in order to silence indigenous voices of protest. So the question then with respect to the problem of epistemicide is how do we take the challenge for open science and decolonize it in ways that interrogate its whiteness and that interrogates its normative logics that perpetuate the colonial capitalist project. So decolonization in this sense is not about creating an invitational dialogic space, but it is fundamentally anti-colonial. It is resistive in its urgency in seeking to dismantle uh, the forms, the structures and the spaces of knowledge production that are embedded in logics of whiteness. Because whiteness in its colonial forms is violence, because whiteness in its colonial form is murder. Uh, whiteness in its colonial forms is extraction and expulsion. So uh, from an indigenous standpoint, 
the problem of decolonization or the challenge of decolonization is one of actually taking down the sides um, that perpetuate whiteness and its logics, uh, dismantling those spaces where science is generated and where uh, the narrative of science is deployed precisely to erase, precisely to expel and to create new markets through these processes of expulsion. Disrupting the claims of open science and the logics that constitute these claims. So a uh, decolonizing framework invites us to interrogate uh, the fundamental ideologies that are embedded in the ideas of openness. So who sets the terms of openness? Who operationally defines what is open? For what purposes and to serve whose purposes? If you, for instance, take the simple idea of transparency from uh, the standpoint of indigenous struggles, or when you locate this question of transparency amidst indigenous struggles, um, you realize or you recognize that, in fact, transparency and its tools pretty much have served uh, to colonize. So uh, the language of transparency has often been used in order to steal uh, the um, indigenous life forms, um, indigenous uh, bioforms, indigenous uh, knowledge systems, and indigenous science in order to incorporate them into uh, the white man's narrative of uh, conquest, conquest and circulation. So the urgency of the indigenous future then is then um, recognizing logics such as transparency and the colonial habits that um, are written into such logics. Similarly, um, an indigenous um, uh, uh, interrogation points to the question of data. Um, who gathers the data? It's, this is especially important when uh, indigenous bodies, indigenous uh, genes, uh, the indigenous DNA is incorporated into colonizing uh, circuits of profiteering while at the same time carrying out the expulsion, erasure, and violence on indigenous peoples. So these questions of data and transparency from the perspective of uh, decolonization have to be anchored in questions of sovereignty, data sovereignty in terms of ownership of data and ownership of information, research sovereignty in terms of sovereignty over the research process, turning this um, uh, lens of ownership um, uh, on its head and really asking the question of where are those infrastructures placed, where knowledge is generated to serve whom, and really working in resistance to hegemonic structures to uh, locate or to move these infrastructures into indigenous domains of knowledge generation that serve uh, the um, uh, life codes, the agentic um, imaginaries of indigenous communities embedded very much in the struggles for indigenous life and livelihood. So um, how do we then safeguard infrastructures of indigenous science? This is a critical question. And this is particularly so because of the violence that is often deployed in order to co-opt and steal indigenous science. So we have an image here of the women farmers in south of India, in uh, Telangana, India, who organize in Sanghams or women's cooperatives working with uh, the women's ways of knowing agriculture and the science of agriculture to map out and plan how they are going to um, uh, cultivate in the next season. So what you see here as an image is the women sitting together um, using chalk to mark out fields and then using branches, trees, leaves in order to create a planting pattern. And then uh, this sort of um, uh, uh, decision-making is guided by the evidence that they have created from earlier agricultural cycles, from the everyday work of observation and from the everyday work of challenging the structures of neoliberal cooptation. So this then in terms of safeguarding the space is also about um, safeguarding the various tools of violence all the way from um, agriculture extension to the advertising and promotional efforts that are put forth by 
transnational corporations and the nation state in order to carry out this form of expulsion. So this really then leads to how do we intervene into the hegemonic structures of science with indigenous knowledge practices? So the question of openness and what constitutes openness is not discussed in elite cosmopolitan circuits located elsewhere, is not discussed and held control over in um, ICA conference sessions and in theme sessions, um, but rather um, is actually articulated practice and uh, put forth from within indigenous uh, struggles, from within the struggles for voice and from within the struggles for methodology, uh, systematic observation and the generation of scientific knowledge. So the culture-centered approach situated in this uh, conversation invites us, offers us a methodological impetus to imagine the work of generating knowledge uh, as cultivating in the works of, um, in the words of Gayatri Spiva, as cultivating the habits of learning to learn from below. So what does it mean to learn to learn from below? And in this process then continually decolonize and open up spaces that are committed to the struggles from below. How do we cultivate a habit of patient listening to an ethic of the other that is, um, uh, always and ever committed uh, to the notion of erasure, uh, to the recognition that uh, the ways in which we participate in the production of science, in the creation and circulation of metrics actually work to silence, to erase, and to perpetuate violence. And through this process, then how do we work toward another um, imagination, which fundamentally is about inversion of the dominant structures of knowledge making and knowledge circulation. So in order to create these infrastructures, the culture-centered approach argues that we need to think about how we build communicative infrastructures that are anchored in equality, equality for opportunities for information, um, information related to specific claims, claims making of science, information related to methodology, information related to uh, representation and resources for representation in terms of who is doing the work of representing. So if you think about it in terms of communication research, when subaltern bodies are often scripted into hegemonic structures of communication knowledge in order to be written about by experts elsewhere, the question here becomes one of how do we decolonize these infrastructures of representation so that the processes of representation are owned by communities that are systematically erased? How do we co-create infrastructures for uh, decision-making? And fundamentally then, how do we co-create infrastructures for voice? So communicative equality is about voice equality, about building opportunities for erased voices to be heard and for those registers uh, to emerge as uh, registers for imagining other possibilities. So ownership here relates to sort of six different forms of ownership that I could think of. One is ownership of knowledge infrastructures where we make knowledge claims. Um, ownership of knowledge infrastructures for method where we claim uh, method as well as discuss method. Uh, ownership of information infrastructures in terms of uh, decision-making processes, who makes these decisions. In the context of the women's lives and livelihoods, they articulate that these decisions are often made, made by elite post-colonial men working together with elite institutions in the global north, all the way from development agencies to United Nations agencies to academic institutions in the north that determine the forms of agriculture uh, that would work, that would often be uh, considered sustainable in order to be disseminated in communities. And here, what is critical to recognize is that the terms of engagement are precisely uh, co-opted in order to serve the agendas of neoliberal uh, capital. So when you hear the term engagement in science communication and open science, the idea of engagement is built upon the logics of colonization, where to engage is to identify new channels in order to disseminate 
uh, science, in other words, in order to perpetuate the colonizing project of white science. So how then in the backdrop of this, do we build um, infrastructures for decision-making that are rooted in the struggles of um, subaltern communities of the global margins? Uh, how do we build resources for voice in terms of decision-making method and then making knowledge claim? So here you have an image and the women uh, talk about this and the ongoing work of uh, the Deccan Development Society, which is a collective of cooperatives or sanghams, where they come together to challenge this neoliberal onslaught of uh, commercialized capitalist agriculture. And they say that if you look at where this information is disseminated, if you look at the communication channels, they have been colonized. So when you look at radio, when you look at pamphlets uh, that disseminate this information about uh, biotechnology, about uh, profit-driven agriculture, uh, they take place through um, uh, communication channels that um, are fundamentally co-opted in capitalist logics. One has to pay high amounts of um, advertising rupees in order to place their messages on these channels. So it is really those with power, those with economic access, and those with political access that then tell the story of science, the practice of science, and uh, the forms of knowledge that are presented as what would work. So for the women in their struggle then, uh, the struggle for um, science and sovereignty in knowledge production, or what one might call as science sovereignty, is about communicative sovereignty. So how do we build uh, spaces of communication that are owned by us within decolonizing context, and that um, create a framework for our participation um, anchored in logics that we have created, rooted in our cultural lives rather than forms of uh, top-down engagement imposed by the status quo. So I want to walk through a couple of examples to demonstrate what I mean by voice infrastructures embedded in this idea of communication sovereignty and material interventions. As you will see here, uh, the voice infrastructures are very much embedded in the materiality of everyday life and everyday struggles within this context for a say over agriculture for a say over um, ecosystems and ecologies. What do you do when communicative spaces and architectures and infrastructures have been colonized? Um, within this context, then, within the context of this particular anti colonial struggle, it is uh, the Bullock cards embedded within the fabric of community life, the songs, the uh, seed banks, the traveling seed banks that you can see that are carrying the seeds that uh, belong in community embedded in community life rather than uh, the seeds manufactured by transnational corporations uh, that um, um, can only be bought and sold through the market. Um, the street processions as they walk from village to village, these become the material sites for articulation. These are the voice architectures that um, are also the architectures for claims making and opening up signs. So co the process of co-creating communication infrastructures then is one about building spaces of communication sovereignty, uh, spaces where uh, claims can be made by those at the global margins, uh, margins that are actively created by the processes of extraction and expulsion, and uh, participate from these margins in terms that are determined by those at the margins, embedded within logics, um, uh, determined by those at the margins. How do we then build plural networks of solidarity that uh, become ways of opening up signs 
through conversations embedded in the everyday methods of struggles of the grassroots and of the subaltern uh, margins. How do we connect across spaces in these struggles? And through these connections, how do we intervene into hegemonic structures? And the work of the women with millets as a climate resistant crop is a great example because through that process, then they build the millet network uh, that then um, uh, brings this form of knowledge generation and this science of knowledge generation across spaces that travels across the global south. But what is also critical uh, to note here is the importance of resistance and keeping intact the resistive politics. And that essentially means that one has to uh, continually monitor, evaluate, and challenge the hegemonic structures that seek to co-opt and colonize. So how does generation of millets embedded in indigenous science then challenge the co-optive moves by the Gates corporations, um, the Gates foundation um, by transnational corporations to then take the millet and turn it into a commodity to uh, profit global capital while actually excluding the women. So the struggle for indigenous science is also the struggle against hegemonic structures and building and sustaining bioresistance. So the work of bioresistance is the process of um, making claims through uh, uh, science and through the process of evidence making embedded within indigenous context, but also uh, retaining the ownership over these claims within these contexts. So the question of science in the setting is turned on its head. For many indigenous struggles, it is about the question is about um, not just what we can share in order to create uh, global frameworks and to build global spaces of resistance, but also what do we keep? Uh, what do we not share? Uh, what uh, knowledge do we keep with us so that uh, this is not turned into another site of colonization? So I will wrap up with um, playing a song from the women's work with agriculture and their struggle. Here they are singing to the seeds and singing itself becomes a site for performing bioresistance. And then I will uh, wrap up with this concept of communication sovereignty as a basis for decolonizing science. The concept of communication sovereignty then is about building and sustaining these communicative spaces that are owned by those at the margins of the margins. Through these processes of ownership, building and sustaining material practices that are embedded in science and the uh, processes of observation, uh, the processes of drawing inferences based upon observation and developing theories, and at the same time embedded within uh, the um, futures of indigenous sovereignty. And uh, through these uh, struggles for voice and um, uh, ownership over scientific processes of decision-making, interrogating sites of power, uh, both um, uh, power held by the state as well as power held by capital, and the ways in which then these networks of power are circulated through systems of knowledge production. So I want to wrap up by uh, discussing the work of the indigenous uh, Guacamelan activist, uh, Rigoberta Menchu, when she says that um, there are some stories that uh, I'm going to share and there are many others that I'm not going to share. Uh, this idea, uh, this active idea of not sharing, of um, keeping as a way for resisting the processes of colonization is a vital uh, register for conversations as we imagine open science, particularly within the context of uh, contemporary global struggles of um, inequality, attacks on indigenous livelihoods and climate change. Thank you so much for participating. Please do 
post your uh, comments and I'll be happy to respond to them. And it's really lovely to be on this panel um, engaged with other speakers uh, that are asking similar questions uh, that critically interrogate uh, the ideas of open science. Thank you.